We've been getting a lot of warnings about financial collateral of late, particularly interest rate swap spreads, which made a huge move last week, and they're still there this week. But financial collateral is not just some quirk of the banking system. It is in many ways the lifeblood, if not the essence of the euro dollar system itself. It is incredibly important. There isn't a part of the monetary system, the financial markets, in the real economy that collateral does not impact. But as important and as critical as it is, it is equally, if not more so, misunderstood. And that's assuming anyone realizes that it's there to begin with. And that's understandable to an extent because collateralized arrangements sound incredibly simple and straightforward. What is there to really bother ourselves about? I give you a piece of financial collaterals in order to borrow funds from you. If I default on that loan, you sell the financial collateral and you're made whole. It sounds like this is nothing more than a way to mitigate the credit risk of engaging in simple borrowing and lending transactions. And if that's all it was, there would be nothing for us to talk about. But as I said, not only is the collateral part of the euro dollar system that important, it is incredibly complicated too. Something called securities lending. And to give you a brief example, a taste of what we're gonna talk about in today's video, I'm gonna go back to February 2013 by the, with a fellow by the name of Jeremy Stein, who was actually a governor of the Federal Reserve System. In a speech which he was talking about reach for yield, he started to get into securities lending. And that's what the real, really the topic is today. Here's how he sets the table. And it's actually a very good way to introduce this entire topic. A badly underwritten subprime loan is one thing. And a badly underwritten subprime loan that serves as the collateral for asset-backed commercial paper held by a money market fund is something else and more dangerous. That's just the tip of the iceberg, but even in that tip, you understand, you can really appreciate it's more, not just dangerous, but critically dangerous than simple, hey, I give you some collateral so that we can mitigate the risk of engaging in a, a simple loan transaction. Securities lending is critically important and it's massively complicated and we're gonna demystify a whole bunch of it today, but first, I'm Jeff, this is Eurodollar University. I do thank you very much for joining me. Eurodollar University, this is what we do in our classroom videos, our memberships. We go through things like securities lending, collateral, the history, the background behind, not just that, the entire Eurodollar system itself. We have videos, it's like I said, classroom videos, basics videos, do Q and A's. We got a resource library that we're expanding all the time all the tools that you need to understand how the euro dollar money network works, why it's like more a telecom network than maybe recognize of a currency system, and how we can put all of these pieces together to understand global reserve currency mechanics in our current day. Again, that's euro dollar university memberships located at our website, eurodollar.university. So I wanna start out with some frightening numbers. I'm going to do so on purpose for reasons that will be clear in just a moment. I'm going to go through JP Morgan's latest quarterly filing, and it could be any number of the big banks around the United States or around the world too, but just picking on JP Morgan, just kind of at random. And this is on page 187 of its latest 10Q. It says, the firm accepts financial assets as collateral that it is permitted to sell or repledge, deliver, or otherwise use. This collateral is generally obtained under resale and other securities financing agreements, prime brokerage related, held for investment customer receivables and derivative contracts. That's a big one too. Collateral is generally used under repurchase and other securities financing agreements to cover short sales and to collateralize derivative contracts and deposits. Okay, complicated stuff, but the numbers really get your attention. The amount of collateral that they're permitted to sell or repledge, deliver or otherwise use, as of June 30th of this year, 1.3 trillion. It's actually down a little bit from the 1.35 trillion at the end of last year. And how much of that 1.3 trillion that they were able to repledge or reuse somehow, did they actually repledge? And as of the end of the second quarter, just shy of a trillion dollars. These figures are relatively typical of any of the big banks around Wall Street, or again, the global banks in the Eurodollar system. 
trillions of dollars in collateral, trillions of dollars worth of collateral that get pledged and repledged and reused all throughout the global system. And in many ways, you look at, you can pick any number of the banks that you want, you look at their, their statistics that look similar, the collateral that's being pledged by JP Morgan to say Morgan Stanley and then pledged, it, continue, it gets repledged all over the place. And what we're really talking about is the, the circulation of securities all throughout the global system. And I know what you're asking, what is the point behind all of this? Well, let's start with a very simple example. Let's talk about a hedge fund that wants to leverage its returns. And in leveraging its returns, it simply wants to borrow funds, as, as many funds as it can, as cheaply as it can. So if you're a hedge fund and you want to invest in, say, junk bonds, the cheapest way to finance that trade, to get the most leverage, is to post the junk bond as collateral in a short-term financing arrangement. And you want it to be short-term because that's the lowest rate, and you want it to be collateralized because that's the least risk. Shortest term, least risk means lowest rate, maximum amount of leverage. But you can't do that necessarily with a junk bond. And you can't necessarily do that unless you're connected to these short-term funding markets, these interbank networks that we're always talking about in the euro dollar system. So you contact a dealer, a broker dealer bank and say, I want to, inv I want to get involved in repo. And the dealer bank says, fine, I will be happy to arrange that for you. But in order to give you the best terms, you've got to give me access to the security that you want to buy. So you want to fund this transaction repo, I got to use that security on your behalf in the repo market. So straight away, in the most simple example that we can think of, the hedge fund has to give the broker dealer bank the ability to reuse the security on its behalf in order to secure the cheapest, best financing that it can find in the repo or secured financing markets. But, there's a bit, there, securities lending, as we're talking about here, is a bit of a misnomer. It's not as if the hedge fund is actually lending the security to the broker-dealer bank that then acts on its behalf. Instead, what the, what the hedge fund is doing is transferring the full title of that security to the broker-dealer. And in exchange, the broker-dealer is promising to give that same security back as necessary for when the hedge fund wants to sell it, or a similar security, it doesn't have to be the same exact one, as well as to pay all of the interest and coupon payments that accrue to the owner, which is now the broker dealer for a little limited time, along the, during the life of this secured financing transaction. So what the hedge fund actually has is a promise from the broker dealer to give it back same or similar securities and to pay out the coupon payments during the life of this transaction. And the hedge fund has to give up legal title to the security because the broker dealer is going to reuse that security, which means it needs to be able to relend that security in the rest of the marketplace. So we're doing this as a way to obtain at the very start, the highest forms of leverage, the most, what looks to be the safest, least risky forms of financing transactions all throughout the Euro dollar system. And if it was, even though that's a little bit more complicated, if it was that and nothing else, we'd be perfectly fine here. But it gets a lot more complicated still. A lot more complicated still. So let's go back to Jeremy Stein in February of 2013. He's going to give you a pretty good example of securities transformation and how complicated this gets, as well as does a really good job of describing the motivations behind some of these transactions, some of these transactions. Imagine an insurance company that wants to engage in a derivatives transaction. To do so, it is required to post collateral with a clearinghouse, and because the clearinghouse has high standards, the collateral must be quote-unquote pristine. That is, it has to be in the form of treasury securities. However, the insurance company doesn't have any unencumbered treasury securities available. All it has is unencumbered form some junk bonds. Here is where the collateral swap comes in. The insurance company might approach a broker-dealer and engage in what is effectively a two-way repo transaction, whereby it gives the dealer its junk bonds as collateral, borrows the treasury securities, and agrees to unwind the transaction at some point in the future. Now, the insurance company can go ahead and pledge the borrowed treasury securities as collateral for its derivatives trade. Of course, the dealer may not have to have the spare treasury securities on hand, and so to obtain them, 
it may have to engage in the mirror image transaction with a third party that does, say, a pension fund. Thus, the dealer would, in the second leg, use the junk bonds as collateral to borrow treasury securities from the pension fund. And the pension fund is simply trying to add to its returns because treasury securities, safe liquid investments, low levels of return. If you can add a little bit of a spread on top, lending these securities to a dealer who's going to relend them to, the, in this case, an insurance company, why wouldn't you do that? So the motivation of the dealer is to add a little bit of spread, to make a little bit of pocket change in, in arranging these transactions. The motivation of the pension fund is to, to make a little bit of a spread in lending the securities. The motivation of the insurance company is it wants to get on this clearinghouse to do a derivative transaction, but doesn't have the collateral to do so. But as far as the marketplace is concerned, we actually have a risky piece of collateral that forms the basis of all these other transactions whose purpose is not necessarily tied to the fundamental characteristics of that collateral to begin with. And this securities lending practice sounds like it's some kind of modern invention, but I can assure you that it's not. Let's go to something that I talked about in one, a couple of our classroom videos in the members section of Eurodollar University. This is a report that came out in July 1999 from IOSCO and CPSS about securities lending. Again, this is July 1999. As a result of regulatory uncertainty and some strictures, by the end of the 1980s, U.S. global custodian banks, U.S. securities firms, and U.K. money, money lenders were starting to develop today's offshore securities lending markets. Again, this is years ago, decades ago. These firms were able to affect securities lending transactions outside the local market through settlement on the books of foreign sub-custodians. Again, offshore. 1980s into the 1990s, doing all of these collateral transformation and securities lending transactions because of the various motivations of all the financial counterparties all around the global Eurodollar system. This is what made the Eurodollar system so effective. And it's also what made it so incredibly dangerous. In order to distribute money, cash, credit, resources, collateral all throughout the global reserve currency system required a level of fluidity that borders on too much fungibility, as we'll see in 2008. But essentially, we have a complicated system of making all of these things work, where treasuries at, form the basis of an entire practice that, that keeps the Eurodollar system in its capacities. Going back to the IOSCO report, as it says, Securities lending has become a central part of securities market activity in recent years, and again, this is 1999, to a point where the daily volume of securities transactions for financing purposes considerably exceeds that of outright purchase and sales transactions. Now, as Stein said in February 2013, and the reason I'm bringing him up is not just he does a good job of describing some of these securities lending practices, but more so it's frustrating for somebody who understands that these transactions take place to then downplay how incredibly important they are, but as well as the dangers involved with them. Because here's what Stein also says. This activity has been around in some form for quite a while and does not currently appear to be of a scale that would raise concerns or raise serious concerns, though the available data on it are sketchy at this point. And what he's really talking about is the domestic part of the securities lending system. And it's incredible that he says that, especially given the fact that Lehman Brothers and AIG and all of those securities lending and collateral shortages were a huge part in their failure. Going back again to IOSCO in 1999, Securities lending markets involve such a wide range of market participants, including many that are not closely regulated, including hedge funds, that comprehensive information on the official size of domestic securities lending markets is difficult to obtain. The fact that for many jurisdictions, the offshore market can be as large as, if not larger than, the domestic market makes data collection even more difficult. And it, makes, it reinforces everything that we talk about when we talk about the black hole analogy. The visible parts of the domestic markets, including the U.S., they don't look all that interesting or that, that dangerous, to use Stein's terms. But you look outside, and you can't look outside. We can't see the repledging and rehusing. We can't see the securities lending practices outside because there is no data. Even though we realize 
as many of us do, how important that collateral is. Financial collateral is not just some quirk. It is absolutely essential to the way in which money works throughout the reserve currency system. We think of treasury supply as maybe the biggest factor in collateral sufficiency, right? Because if we're talking about the best quality collateral, we're talking about treasury securities. And if we're talking about treasury securities, then the treasury supplies those securities. But what we're really talking about in all these complicated transactions is a form of velocity, reuse, repledging. How often a security, and it doesn't have to be a treasury security, it could be any security, how often they get reused is a measure of sufficiency. It's a measure of fluidity. It's a measure of how the euro dollar system is functioning and whether it's functioning well or functioning poorly. Because if the velocity of collateral slows down, dealers don't read pledge and reuse at the same rate they did before, the entire monetary system itself must slow down. Because think about it from the perspective of the hedge fund or the insurance company. If you can't easily obtain the collateral from all of this complicated, uh, all this complicated securities lending business, you can't do the activities that you want to do. You can't, you can't lay off risk in the derivative transaction the insurance company wanted to do. So it has to restrict its own abilities. The hedge fund can't invest in the way it does. It wants to because it can't obtain the leverage it wants. So that's a security that doesn't get bought. Prices are affected. Activity is affected. It is the dealers in the collateral system that make all of this work, which is why we pay so much attention to them. And I'll give you some more examples here. This comes from FRBNY. In fact, this is the settlement, uh, settlement guide for fails, repo fails. Once a significant volume of fails occurs, lenders of collateral sometimes also withhold collateral because they are concerned that existing fails diminish the likelihood of that collateral being returned to them. Such withholding can be self-fulfilling because withholding scarce collateral can increase the incidence of fails in and of itself. So as collateral is circulating all throughout the system, being reused and repledged all over the place, you have a little bit of hiccup over here, and that could cause dealers to say, oh, oh, if we have a fail over here, that might mean some collateral that I've pledged and reused, I might not get that back. So as we see incidences of fails rise, it leads to the self-reinforcing spiral where dealers withhold collateral from the system, which makes it even worse, incre increasing the level of fails as well as the, the frictions in the collateral circulation, therefore impeding collateral velocity, reducing velocity regardless of supply of treasuries or top quality collateral. Going back to FRBNY, this can lead to a daisy chain of fails where A's failure to deliver bonds to B causes B to fail on a sale of the same bonds to C, causing C to fail on the similar sale to D, and so on. A daisy chain becomes, believe it or not, a round robin if the last participant in the chain is itself failing, failing to the first participant. That's how much collateral gets circulated. It gets reused and reused and reused. And that's how we get to those numbers I mentioned at the beginning of the video from JP Morgan, who has 1.3 trillion in collateral available to be reused and 1 trillion that has been reused because a lot of it goes back and forth between all of these dealers in, in their various securities lending transactions. So when circulation of collateral becomes interrupted, dealers will They'll charge more to buy of them. They'll buy more of them. We'll see this in financial indications such as swap spreads, treasury bill prices, all the repo fails, all the stuff that we mentioned as pointing us in the direction of collateral circulation and velocity. And the reason there is so much velocity is because it's that important to the operation of the euro dollar system. And the euro dollar system is the global reserve currency. Therefore, Collateral is a huge part. And if collateral was a simple thing, as simple as me just posting collateral to you to borrow funds, we wouldn't be talking about it. What we're looking to do is to find some clues about that velocity inside of collateral. How many, how many times, how much it's being reused and repledged so that we can, we can make some judgments about the sufficiency of collateral, therefore the ability of the euro dollar system to continue to operate in the capacity that we need it to. When collateral is short and more so when the reuse rate appears to be restricted, when dealers become risk averse because of all these dynamic principles, that's when we know there's likely to be trouble. And that's what collateral can tell us. And that's why we pay attention so much to these collateral indications. It's about 
securities lending. And contrary to Federal Reserve officials who downplay the importance here, we know the importance of the offshore part of the system. And we know that offshore, the numbers get to be incredibly huge. This is something you need to pay attention to because it is the lifeblood of everything around it. If you want to look at the connection, look deeper into the connection between interest rate swaps and collateral, check out a video I just did recently on interest rate swap spreads. As always, I thank you very much for joining me. Huge thank you, Eurodollar University members and our research subscribers. Until next time, take care.